inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to uh, address some of these issues along with my distinguished colleagues, Warren Young and others. Um, I'll start with a little story. Um, I've been to Japan briefly twice before, and my first trip was to Osaka. And uh, among the sites I visited was Osaka Castle. Um, and when we got to the Osaka Castle, we discovered it was a wooden structure. So I, I wondered how long a wooden structure would last as a castle. And I was told that it didn't really matter because we keep rebuilding it. Um, coming from a background where in, the, in Europe and Middle East, castles are stone structures usually. They're not typically rebuilt. They, they may be uh, conquered, uh, destroyed, sometimes repaired, but not typically rebuilt. It was actually a great revelation to me that Osaka Castle was meant to be rebuilt. And that's relevant to what we're talking about. So hold that thought and I'll come back to it. As environments change, management and governance have to be adaptive. And uh, I, I'm not a governance expert, as, as Oren is. I come into this more from an adaptive management point of view as, a, as an ecologist, that's my background. Um, but of course governance is the bigger picture from, from just management. And uh, the previous slide on Lake Biwa shows that, that as these three big changes uh, have an impact on Lake Biwa, one moves from one kind of social ecological system into another, and the question is how. So we got to look at these multi-level interactions, we got to look at different actors, and consider some very difficult questions such as equity, and as Oren pointed out, pinning down equity is, is really quite different. Difficult, <coughs> difficult. Um, I focus on knowledge, social learning, and participatory approaches. And, uh, and looking at the system as a whole means we need to move from the ecological system into something bigger that involves humans. So what I'm hoping to do in this presentation is to talk about the idea of complex adaptive systems in particular, social ecological systems as complex systems. Um, the, the idea of SES has already been uh, presented. I, I want to explain to you a little bit on the background of this SES idea. Then I want to turn to multi-level linkages and I will give you examples, three different, quickly, but three different examples from local to global, multi-level linkages, and then I want to turn to adaptive management, adaptive governance, learning by doing is how we normally characterize adaptive management, and, uh, and, and get to the idea of the, the ability to respond to change, and that's, that's resilience. So I'm going to tie up my resilience to the idea of adaptive management. Now, complex systems, as different from simple systems, show certain characteristics. They address scale issues. Simple systems don't have scale. Complex systems do. Thanks. Um, complex systems have issues of uncertainty, um, issues of nonlinear responses, meaning a simple change in the system doesn't always translate into a similar system change uh, overall, but, but rather a small change may cause a big change in the system, or a big change may cause a small change in the system. Also, multiple, the idea of multiple stability domains, you can have 
a system that does one thing, let's say savannas in Africa, and it can flip and become a system of, of, of brush vegetation. Um, as the, the session introduction mentioned, if we only focus on the ecological part of the system, we are only getting part of the picture. Because people and nature are often interdependent systems. So both social and ecological systems by themselves are complex systems, but they're also linked. That this uh, comes out of work done by resilient scholars. The argument here is that conventional science and management is appropriate when uncertainty is low and control controllability is high. So conventional environmental science and management is a good fit. Uh, if you have a controllable environment where uncertainty is low or, or if you like predictability is high. For most scientists this means a laboratory system because you can really you can really control the, the environment and you can keep uncertainty low. But as soon as we get into complex adaptive systems where uncertainty is high and the system is not really controllable, then we're in the area of adaptive management. And that creates problems with, for scientists because we no longer are dealing with science. We're dealing with something more complicated, quite often something that involves people, policies, drivers, and all these messy things that, that is the reason we're here together. So this is how we uh, envisioned this concept of social ecological systems. This is work done with uh, colleagues from Sweden, uh, Karl Polke and others, the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics. <coughs> and there are two books that came out of this. The, the original uh, work is called Linking Social and Ecological Systems. Um, the argument we make is the Social ecological system should be used as a unit of analysis, not just the social system, which is something that sociologists and anthropologists deal with, and not just the ecological part of the system, which is what ecologists and other scientists deal with, but the two together. Because the two um, are linked, they are coupled, they are interdependent, change in one causes change in the other. They are co-evolutionary, they tend to adapt to one another. And they are multi-level or nested. So that in a social system you might have governance at the level of a village, or a district, or a region, or a nation, or global. And in an ecosystem you can have a, a small watershed in a larger watershed in a larger watershed. So that's what I mean by nested. Practical example, maybe the Japanese SES concept of a Sato Umi, a mosaic of coastal ecosystems. If, if I'm understanding right, Sato Umi is a relatively recent concept and it actually comes from Sato Yama, um, a mosaic of mixed forests, rice paddies, grasslands, etc. Um, and it's not an abstract concept, it's, it's an applied concept. And I understand that it's been applied to rebuilding after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Now, I talk about multi-level linkages from local to global. And uh, um, I, I'm using definitions from a paper that Warren, Warren and I are co-authors of, Cash, Adger, etc. paper that came out in 2006. This is, it didn't create these definitions, but it, it put these definitions together where um, scale 
is the spatial, temporal, quantitative, or analytical dimensions used to measure something, uh, any phenomenon. And levels are units of analysis that are located at different positions on that scale. So if the scale is a spatial scale, you might have patches, landscapes, regions, globe. If the scale is temporal scale, you might have slow and fast. And the slow may be day, season, moving on to, to annual, multi-decadal, and so on. You might have an administrative or a jurisdictional scale um, where you might have jurisdiction at the local level, say village level, provincial, national, intergovernmental, you might have institutional. This one happens to use, I think, the Ostrom levels of Eleanor Ostrom, the uh, common scholar, which talks about operating rules uh, all the way to constitutional rules. So that's, so when I say multi-level, that's, that's what I mean. I will uh, quickly give you examples from three kinds of multi-level systems. I'm not addressing Lake Biwa because that's still going to come and I don't know enough about it anyway. So the first of them, the first, is a biosphere reserve from Sweden. It's called Kristenstad Vattenriske, Vattenriske Biosphere Reserve. Um, that's what it looks like from the air. There is a Eco Museum, uh, which is a sort of center of operations, but also it turns out, I'll show you in a moment, is where the networks get together to, to, to solve problems. Uh, there are recreational uses, there are bird watching clubs, there are cultural uses, and there's farming. And if you look at the multi-level linkages in this example, you find that you have farmers, landowners, local businesses at this lower level, individual level. You have municipal administrations, local communities at that level. You have country administrative board, local farmers organizations at that level. Uh, you have, and, and so on, up to regional, national, and global. It has a global level because it's a, um, it's a stopping point for migratory waterfowl. Um, so it, it connects a number of different countries. So there is a, there is a, um, an international and global level. Global also because it, it connects up to Denmark and Poland in terms of, of wetland restoration projects. So that's one example. The second example I want to show you is a very different one from Northern Canada. This is about the management of uh, small whales. It's a co-management operation with government people and local Inuit people. Uh, it's a legal co-management. Let's say beluga whale being caught for blood sampling for population determination. Maybe they looked at the isotopes, but I uh, just joke. I don't know if they did. If you look at the multi-level linkages in this case, actually it's, it's quite complicated. But you can simplify it by saying, first you have local groups, which are local Inuit hunters and trappers organizations. You've got the regional uh, groups, again, local Inuit. You have a bridging organization, which ties the various levels together. Um, as in the Swedish case, that, that building I showed you, the Eco Museum. And then it's got the national level with the Inuit national organization and the, the federal government fisheries and oceans organization. And then you have an international level. Uh, when you look at the, the, the small mammals that cross between Canada and, and Russia, and between, again, Canada and Greenland, Denmark on the other side. The third example I'm going to show you, we take you to Africa. Uh, Namibia, wildlife conservation. So the, I, I chose these because they are very different kinds of examples. A protected area, 
a, a core management of small whales and, and then a wildlife conservation area. Um, this is work done by Arthur Hull, one of our PhD students. Uh, lots of wildlife, even though it's very dry, but somewhat comically, you, you find these elephants not watering themselves, but actually bathing themselves in the sand. And then your multi-stakeholders. So the structure here looks like that. Um, in the 1980s, you had basically these two levels and, and few uh, players, a local level and, and some, some international NGOs. In the 1990s, you have an increase in the number of players, but also increase in the number of levels. So you have local, national, and international. International being NGOs that, that provide support for this conservation project. And then more recently, in the 2000s, you have well-organized community level and uh, many more players at the national and international level. So that gives you an idea of, of how, how the multi-level linkages work and, and how the idea can be illustrated in, in somewhat different ways. Now, the, the learning by doing adaptive governance. It has, it's about the ability to, of social and ecological systems to respond to change. I'm, I'm using governance rather simplistically compared to uh, the amazing details that already I went into. Uh, and let's say governance, I'm simply using it as a, the more inclusive term in which institutions operate. So governance is about politics, sharing of responsibility and power, including the question of who makes the decisions. Adaptive governance uh, is similar to what Oren Young mentioned in, in one of his publications, the type two governance. Type one governance in a world of change involves making small adjustments and they work, or you hope they work. Type two governance is where you have to reframe. I thought he was going to get into those today, but he didn't, so I have it here anyway. Um, but the important point of adaptive management and, and the bigger brother of adaptive management, adaptive governance, is that it deals with uncertainty. Oops. It deals with uncertainty. It takes uncertainty into account, and it takes feedback learning into account. And that's, that's a very important uh, distinction. Well, what is adaptive governance good for? A number of things, but the, the one I'm going to emphasize here is that it's the ability to respond to change, which we call resilience, defined by Walker et al. as the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change, so as to still retain essentially the same function, structure, identity and feedbacks. So, resilience is not bouncing back to some original state. It assumes change is a constant, um, but it's able to reorganize and, and sort of absorb the change so that as a system it has the same identity, function, etc. So that's, that's uh, the, the usually accepted definition of resilience, but of course there are other definitions of resilience as well. The point is, a resilient SES has the ability to respond to shocks and stresses while maintaining that functioning and identity of the system. So, going back to that Lake Biwa slide um, that was presented before I started, if you, if you look at those three big um, Drivers, an aging population, for example, is a, is a slow driver. It's a stress rather than a shock. So we're talking about how the system is able to deal with that change 
and, and still retain its identity. So you might think of resilience as a continuum. Uh, it used to be thought that resilience was just this adaptive capacity of making incremental adjustments, but I'm, I'm using the arguments by Christoph Bene and Kate Brown in UK, and, and talking about resilience in terms of this, this continuum where you can go from a coping capacity and persistence to adaptive capacity, but if the change goes beyond the adaptive capacity of the system, then the system transforms. So we're talking about transformative capacity of the system. Let's say you have a lake full of fishermen and fish and things change and the whole system becomes a recreational area with, with negligible importance of, of the fishery. So that's a, that would be a transformed system. Now, operationalizing adaptive governance is, is, is a problem. We're, we're uh, still dealing with this. There's a special issue of the journal Sustainability in which we, we both, Orrin Young and I, have both contributed. And I was actually quoting from that paper. Um, what, do we, what, what do we have? How do we operationalize? First, we have to be able to experiment and learn from that experiment. Second, we, we have to drop uh, ideas of conventional science and, and uh, management because it's based on assumptions of equilibrium and controllability. The conventional systems, the conventional science and management is rather simplistic. Uh, it's based on yes, no, black and white kind of responses and it, it hardly ever works that way. Um, now, Western science tells us that things have precise answers, but if you recall that figure I showed you, that only applies in a limited area. As soon as you're dealing with complex adaptive systems and, and change, it does not apply anymore. Here, I'm speculating, and it's not in the notes, but I'm speculating that, that, that Japan and the Japanese may have an advantage in that um, they, they do use science, you, they use science, but you don't have to use it as, a, as, a, as the only way to deal with things. Um, an analogy, I don't know how good an analogy might be, you, you could be a Buddhist and a Shintoist. Buddhist tells you, Buddhism tells you certain things and Shintoism provides values and you can use both. In the Western system, Western scientists sticking to the rules of science and how to do science and how to do management based on science do not have that flexibility. So you may actually have an advantage in, in operationalizing adaptive management, adaptive governance based on that idea that you can transcend this black and white, yes or no kind of approach to science. considering multiple possibilities and alternative solutions. So back to the Osaka castle. Uh, just as you can rebuild Osaka castle many times over, think of adaptive governance as sort of an Osaka castle where you conceptualize the, the problem, you plan actions and monitoring, you implement actions and monitoring, you analyze, use, and adapt, and very important, you capture and share, communicate, if you like, that learning, and then you start all over again. This uh, is, the, is the basic adaptive management cycle, I'm, I'm saying, also applies to adaptive governance. It's that learning by 
by doing cycle. City planners are supposed to use it. I don't know how well they use it globally. Parks planners are supposed <coughs> to use this. In Canada, national parks have a 10-year cycle. But I don't think I've, I've ever seen one where they, they actually did all that learning and, and, and repeated the cycle in the, in the following 10 years with, with that learning in, in their heads. But that's, that's the, the, the basic idea. Now, the one difference from the Osaka castle is that now the environment in which the castle is located is changing very fast. And that's why we have to have that type two governance that Oren Yang talks about. So we're not talking about the artisans exactly reproducing the castle, but now the artisans have to consider differences or changes in temperature, in moisture, um, I don't know, maybe um, uh, insects eating through the wood, um, but having to do a somewhat different, a somewhat modified version of the Osaka castle. So that's, 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 that's the point. Adaptive governance being an ongoing process, and the quotation says, management or governance is not a search for the optimal solution to one problem, but an ongoing learning and negotiation process where high priority is given to questions of communication, perspective sharing, and development of adaptive group strategies for problem solving. And that's, of course, the, pop, the participation part that we were talking about in the earlier talk. And that learning by doing requires knowledge co-production, social learning, and that, that kind of participatory research. But since I'm running short on time, I'm going to simplify. Uh, here, the, the point I want to mention is that this idea of co-producing knowledge is about the collaborative process of bringing together a plurality of knowledge sources to address a defined problem. So, this is what you're doing here in RIN. Uh, natural science, social science. In, in a lot of our work, we also include local knowledge, if any, traditional knowledge. Do the local fishermen and Lake Biwa have traditional knowledge, which you can put together with your ecology and come up with new solutions, new approaches? That's the question we're asking. The, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the work comes from uh, Maria Tengo in Sweden and her team. And it's being used in um, the current IPES, the, the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So, uh, how you do the knowledge production, going back to the Swedish uh, Biosphere Reserve case, is that you might have clusters of, of bird conservation groups, water quality groups, cultural heritage groups. Not all of them are going to be interested in knowledge co-production, but some will be. So then you need this, this eco-museum bringing together those parties that can exchange information and put their knowledge together to do something different. And that's the idea of knowledge co-production. Skip that. Uh, skip this except to mention that participatory research, as, as you do in Lake Biwa, is very important because, among other things, it helps communities increase their own understanding of change. So, so you are engaging in social change <coughs> while doing research in a participatory way. Not just having people sit in a room and, and participate in something, but, but doing research together. And to do that, you need to do some capacity development. That other question that came up in the first session, that does, can everybody pitch into this, this, this participation? Well, sometimes you have to do capacity development. And this is from a project we had in Brazil, where uh, our, uh, our workers from my university and Brazil universities are working with local fishing groups. Um, to, to build that capacity so they can, they can work with government parks planners. With, without the capacity development, they speak two different languages. 
So we, we, we try to get them to a stage by playing games, doing all kinds of things, so that, that they can actually engage in a, in a meaningful way with government managers who often tend to be rather dismissive of, of local users, like fishermen. So, conclusions. Um, adaptive government governance responds to the need to deal with rapid change. And uh, it's not just about government regulations, but uh, you can use a smart mix of regulations, market incentives, but of course, bottom-up community-based self-governance becomes very important. I had more on this, but I took it up because I was going over time. But as Oren pointed out, I'm, I'm the guy who talks about the bottom-up stuff, and he's the one who talks about the, the bigger governance issues. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, to make this process dynamic is really, really important, because that's the only way you can address cross-scale problems, that is, across space and time scales. And to make all this dynamic, the emphasis has to be on social learning. And it's, it's that ongoing adjustments that makes adaptive governance dynamic. And uh, finally, governance requires collaborative approaches and multiple voices, because we're no longer in that in that quadrat, if you think back to that figure, where science reigns supreme, where we're outside of the comfort zone of science. Uh, the fishermen in Lake Biwa may have insights that I, as an ecologist, may not have. So I need to learn. But also, as we do governance, I can make mistakes as somebody making decisions. So you need to share the responsibility for, for bad decisions, the risk of bad decisions, and that becomes very important. You, you need to work with people so that, and you're going to make mistakes. Uh, because we're in this, this zone where mistakes are probably more common than, than correct decisions. So you want to share uh, the risk of making mistakes, but also to learn from them. And that's why you need collaborative approaches. Thank you.